My first slide is, uh, that sometimes happens to me. I have been at a party and uh, it always comes out somehow. I want to talk about soil science and geomorphology and people glaze over. So I'm so happy to be here tonight and be able to talk about soil science and geomorphology with people who actually would like to hear about it. Uh, using the study of soil genesis and morphology to assist in archaeological investigations. This is, I'm actually a soil scientist with, uh, my training was, I thought I was going to do strep mine reclamation. And I spent a few years um, mapping soils for the soil survey. And I worked for a consult consulting firm in Pittsburgh and the archaeologists kept calling me out saying, hey, can you, you know, interpret this for us and that? And I said, yeah, and now that was in 1985, and I've done almost nothing other than assisting uh, phase one, two, or three archaeological investigations, and, and I've loved it. It's been a great diversion in my uh, career path. Now, soils come in all colors, all sizes. All This is obviously a very undeveloped, plain soil. Nothing much is happening here, but you look at this one, look at all this structure, all these peds. This is a very, very old soil. And we will be discussing why you will see this picture again. There aren't any defined peds in this one. The color is different. And we're gonna try to investigate why. Here's a shallow soil. This is the bedrock. This was an unplowed, there was a quite a nice site here, an unplowed residual soil forming directly out of the siltstone and sandstone underneath. This is an um, Spodosol. They're beautiful soils that are common up in New England. Um, they have an E horizon here. It's a, it's a, a light color that is stripped of iron and some organic matter and all of that iron and organic matter ends up in these, in the subsoil. It, they really can be quite beautiful. So a soil will age through the processes of physical and chemical weathering and if we can learn to read the effects of those changes, we can better understand the genesis and the relative age of the profile, relative. Uh, soil pedogenesis and morphology is the study of how soils form and change the initial parent material. You have the initial parent material and it begins to, to change through the processes of uh, soil pedogenesis if it is exposed to weathering. And you can end up with a very complex uh, series of different subsoil horizons, or it can be, I've seen soil horizons with one horizon from top to bottom, brand new parent material. And I've seen horizons like, I've seen soil profiles like this, very complex stacked horizons. So how did this soil form? Has it changed over time? Has it been disturbed at all? How old is this profile? That's the main question I get all the time. Or as I am frequently asked, where do we dig and how deep? That's usually the bottom line. So the five soil forming factors are very, very important to remember. First of all, there's parent material. What are we working with? This is the material in which a soil forms. It could be weathered sandstone, granite, River sediments, uh, vol volcanic ash, shale, fill, sawdust, surface mine spoil, anything that is exposed to weathering can be considered soil. All it has to do is support plant growth. So if it supports plant growth, weeds, whatever, it's considered the soil. The second one is organisms. We have grasses, ants, trees, horses, cows, um, it could be any stage of life, dead animals, dead roots, growing trees, dead trees, everything changes. We have uh, groundhogs, crayfish, anything that uh, changes the soil really has a great effect. Temperature, the climate, the rate of soil development up here in the Northeast United States or the Atlantic States is gonna be much different than it would be in the tropics. And up in the uh, Arctic conditions, we have very slow, slow soil development. And in the tropics, we have the fastest soil. The tropics, those tropical forests eat themselves constantly. They die and feed off the old organic matter constantly. And the rate of soil development down there is lightning fast compared to up here. Uh, topography and aspect. Topography is the slope and the position on the landscape. So we have like a summit, a side slope, 
a level floodplain. An aspect is the direction that the slope is facing. A south facing slope is going to be warmer than a north facing slope. So you'll have a slightly more rapid rate of soil development on a south facing slope than you will a north facing slope. Um, time. Is it pre-Pleistocene? Is it millions of years old? Is it Pleistocene? Is it late Pleistocene or Holocene? Uh, are these glacial deposits or is this post-glacial or unaffected completely by glaciers? Now, I want you to proceed with caution here. The five soil forming factors must be considered together and in context when assessing the genesis and relative age of a soil profile. The changes, for example, a certain subsoil horizon called a cambic horizon. I have seen uh, cambic horizons form in soils that are somewhere between one and 2,000 years old. And I have seen soil profiles that are 10 to 12,000 years old that don't even have a cambic yet. So you can't say that, oh, I see a cambic, therefore it's 1,000 years old. Um, you have to take it into, into context with all the other soil forming factors. Another thing to be cautious about, and I know because I worked for the, for the soil survey mapping soils in Ohio, it was a wonderful experience. But you know our, our sampling size is about one, one boring per 10 acres. So please keep that in mind. It is not meant to be a site specific tool. It's more of a, of a geomorphological or landforms map. You can see what kinds of soils appear on the, on the summit, What's a typical side slope? What do you they what are they seeing in the in the floodplains? You can learn a lot, but you can't just take one point and say, okay, I know what's there. You need to go all around the landscape and learn what's in there. Also, the smallest um, amount acreage we could circle and and delineate with a soil type was two acres. So anything that's smaller than two acres, it's going to get lost completely. So take it with a grain of salt. It can be a great predictive tool. So how do soils form? First, let's get into the basics. Soils are predominantly composed of mineral particles. That's really what we're going to talk the most about. Rock fragments, sand, silt, and clay. We have organic matter. That's anything from life forms, carbonates, uh, cations, anions, soluble salts, water, and air. We need all those things in, in concert for the uh, formation of soil. We're going to talk mostly about the mineral particles today, though. If you remove the organics and the rock fragments from a soil sample, you have what's called the fine earth fraction of the soil. And these are small particles of silica, silicate rock just defined according to size, sand, silt, and clay. Sand and silt are generally rounded, uh, but clay particles are flat like pieces of paper. Individual sand and the largest silt particles can be seen with the naked eye. You might have to have a microscope for a silk, silt particle. But the viewing of a clay particle requires an electron, a scanning electron microscope. So here is the relative size of sand, but these clay particles are way too big. <laughs> They're even smaller than that. Uh, gravels, you get those out of the way. Sand is about this size. It feels gritty. Everybody knows what sand. You can have fine sand, coarse sand. Silt feels velvety, like talcum powder. If you can work it really well in your hand, but it's not sticky, it feels like maybe flour. Uh, it's soft and, and you can work it. Clay is sticky. Everybody knows what high clay soil feels like. If you're working it, a little bit of water in there and you put your hand up and that clay is sticking to your fingers, it's probably got a lot of clay. So the relative sizes of soil particles, a sand would be like a city bus to a small office building. A silt particle would be like a small car to a city bus, and clay would be anywhere from a postage stamp to a bath towel. And in most soils, all three particles are present. You almost have to have particles sorted out, like beach is going to be mostly sand because it's been sorted constantly by the water. Uh, clay, it's pretty unusual to find it pure clay. It has to be a depositional environment like a, like a, a lake bottom. Uh, and silt, you really pretty much find that everywhere. So high amounts of sand increase the porosity 
but it doesn't have the surface area to hold on to water and nutrients. Water just moves right through it. High amounts of clay make it very hard for air to get in there. And if they're very fertile soils, they have a high water uh, holding capacity, high nutrient comp uh, holding capacity, but they're very, very difficult to work. So a good mixture of all three of these, which is called a loam, so if you hear of a silt loam, that is a, a loam, a mixture of all three that's predominantly silt and sandy loam, the same thing, uh, predominantly sand. The percentages of sand, silt, or clay, which is called the texture in the soil, that greatly affects the type, amount, activity, and retention of the other ingredients of soil, organic matter, carbonates, et cetera. Soils that are high in clay, um, they weather and develop or show their age much differently and much more quickly than soils that are high in sand. Much of the difference has to do with the surface area to volume ratio of each particle. So bear with me, I'm gonna to try to make this as easy to understand as I can without nerding out. Most of the processes of chemical and physical weathering takes place on the surfaces of soil particles. So if you can imagine peeling like an orange, you peel off the surface of one gram, a gram of sand, a gram of silt, and a gram of clay. With a gram of sand, you could cover about three lines on the page of a book. In silt, you could cover about four pages of the book, but with clay, you can cover two walls of a bedroom. That's how much surface area is in clay. So obviously, if you've got a little clay in that soil, a lot more is gonna be happening and it's going to weather more deeply, more, um, more quickly. You have to take that into consideration. Soil texture is determined by the percentages of sand, silt, and clay. And that's what we see inside of the textural triangle. I am really happy if I can feel, I feel the soil with my, my fingers. You add a little bit of water until you can work it. Some people do the ribbon kind of a thing. There's great flow charts out there to determine the texture by feeling it. Um, I'm really happy if I can get it into the uh, textural class. Loam, silt loam, sandy loam. I'm pretty good at that. Um, there are soil scientists who can get like down to the one or two percentage uh, of clay, sand and silt. I'm not that good, but I don't need to be. So um, if you're putting in a, a, an in-ground septic system, you need to be a little better, but that's not my calling. So let's get back to the five, five soil forming factors. We've got parent material, the number one thing that we look at, and this is very important. That's the material in which a soil forms. It could be weathered sandstone, fill, sawdust. We talked about that. Organisms. These are all the things. Oh, we talked about that already too. So let's get back to the soil forming uh, factors. The different types of parent material. Residuum. This is soil that has formed in place from weathering bedrock. This is soil that takes an awfully long time to be generated. It's forming right out of the rock. Um, colluvium, this is material that has slid into place by gravity. And most of the colluvium that we find in Pennsylvania is stable colluvium. It has been there, it's slid into place during the periglacial conditions that we had during the Pleistocene, pretty much slid into place from all the freeze thaw and the, the water that was freezing and thawing, all this stuff kind of slid down. And it has been relatively stable. Most of the colluvium I see is very stable. It's been there forever. So we, we don't worry about it. But sometimes at the bottom of a slope, it can be covering what used to be a, a floodplain. So that's always concern. At the bottom of a hillside, it might, be, it might be covering something that's underneath it. But that would be a more modern slip, a, a slide into place. Alluvium is anything that's water deposited. It could be sand, silt, clay, gravels, anything. And it could be really old or really young. Glacial till, that was material that was pushed by glacial ice. There are soils that are 100% organic matter or very, very high. Sphagnum uh, moss, these occur in, in bogs. We don't have too much of that in Pennsylvania. It's a little bit in Ohio. Volcanic ash, we have that mostly in the Northwest. Luss or aeolian deposits. We had many, many feet of this in Ohio. Came from when the Mississippi River uh, Valley 
uh, dried up at the end of the Pleistocene and all this uh, sediment was blown in. Uh, we had a lot of it anywhere between a foot and 30 feet in some places. Uh, Man-made or altered materials, surface mines, boil. Today, we're mostly going to discuss these top three. Everything in, in Pennsylvania, well, we do have glacial till, but we usually are looking at residuum, colluvium, and alluvium. Hard sandstone is resistant to weathering, and this can remain as a steep, rocky, unstable. I bet if we go back in a million years, there won't really be that much uh, change here. Sandstone is so resistant to weathering that you will see this for a really long time. Shale weathers to a more gentle and rolling slope. Colluvium is anything that has uh, slid downhill. Uh, this looks like a predominantly uh, limestone soil, but if it has, uh, you know, slid downhill, it's considered colluvium. Now, uh, alluvium, now the first two, generally speaking, uh, as far as archaeology goes, we only look at the surface because it's been there the entire Holocene and probably, you know, late Pleistocene at least. So anything that's uh, residual colluvial is probably we're only going to be looking at the surface for any kind of uh, archaeological remains. But alluvium, that's another, uh, uh, that's another story. And this is typically of the utmost interest to archaeologists. We have gravels or sands, or it can be fine, silts or clays. Uh, it could be old or young, Pleistocene or older, Ice Age deposits anywhere from 2.5 million to 10,000 years BP. That's a Pleistocene age. Or the Holocene, which is the present time period, and can vary in age from 10,000 years to like last week, could be very modern. This uh, is a 60 foot high bank of gravels and sand deposited in a broad outwash terrace by glacial meltwaters at the close of the Wisconsin glacial event. This is about 11,000 years old. It's in Tuscarawas County, Ohio. Even though this is all alluvium, something to get excited about, Archaeological sites would only be in the surface here because obviously nobody's going to be living in the meltwater as it's depositing this material. And there are no buried uh, former surfaces that would have survived. This would have completely scoured anything that was in its way and completely you know, scoured that entire valley and then put down this uh, bank of alluvium. So only the surface we'd be looking here. Now, fine sand and silt in Holocene overbank accumulation. Here we're going to be anything within this bank, any horizontal plane could have been an occupational surface in the past. So for, for overbank alluvium next to a stream like that, we're going to be testing from the surface all the way down to gravels. That's where the archeological potential not, not just in the surface. You've got to go all the way down to you hit gravels. Uh, so let's go back. I'm not sure why I did that again. Let's go here. So the rate of weathering as affected by climate. This is the annual temperature. So we're going from warm to cold as we go up here. And this is the annual rainfall. So we're going from very dry to very wet. So this is hot and rainy. This would be the tropics. We have really strong chemical weathering here, a lot going on. But moderate chemical weathering when there isn't as much rainfall and almost none when there's not much rainfall. It might be hot, but it's dry. You don't have the water to bring all that material down into the subsoil. You have very slight weathering of any kind. We're in this area. We're at moderate chemical weathering, but we do have some frost action. So we have quite, we have a moderate rate of soil development. When you get up here, this is cold and icy. You have a lot of strong mechanical weathering. That's like freeze thaw, freeze thaw. There's not going to be that much chemical weathering because it's too cold. But where it's cold and dry, parts of the Arctic, there's not much of any of any weathering going on here either. So the most weathering really is going to be the hot and rainy tropics or the uh, cold and icy areas of the, of the Arctic. And we kind of get a little bit of everything right here. 
So as we look to see, as soil scientists or geomorphologists look to see how far along the soil has developed, we have to take into consideration those five soil forming factors. And we try to see what pedogenic horizons are present. So pedogenesis is the soil development and the, and the, um, the appearance of soil horizons within a soil profile. And examples are a surface A horizon, a subsoil cambic horizon, or an argillic horizon, or a fragipan horizon. These are all horizons that have changed the parent material. It's very important. Change the parent material to reflect something different. If you still see the striations of deposition by water, it hasn't changed much. When soil development occurs, it changes the parent material and we start seeing ped structure. We start seeing a whole different thing. And the further along that is, the older the soil, taking into consideration the five soil forming factors. So horizons are identified and delineated by examining many different soil characteristics, but the top three are color, using the Munsell color book. And I'm always so glad when I see people in the field using their own eyes to determine what the color is, um, because everybody's eyes is just a little bit different. Uh, I have gotten colors that are completely different in the morning than they were in the afternoon. So I trust data that has been actually seen and, and recorded by the person in the field. So don't look at your neighbor, don't look at the soil survey, uh, use your own eyes. Uh, texture, that's another thing we look at, the percentages of sand, silt, and clay, and we go to the uh, textural triangle and we have to use trained fingers. Or you can go to a lab for 20 bucks, you can get a particle size distribution done and it'll tell you exactly what, uh, what uh, textural class it's in, but it costs 20 bucks. I would really be breaking people's budgets if I did that all the time. And it isn't really important for me to be that uh, precise. I can use my hands and get very close. Now the soil structure. Uh, this is also called ped structure or aggregate structure. You have to have a, a, a face. You have to have a profile exposed. My favorite uh, size is about a, a meter wide and a meter deep, which is uh, convenient since that's about what a unit is. Um, you have to lift the peds out of the wall. You have to take a trowel and just sort of coax them out of the wall. If all you're getting is a divot made by your, by your trowel, then it probably doesn't have much structure. But if you start digging in there and you see cracks and formations around separate, not clods. Clods are made by your fist. That's a, a, a not a natural ped. You start seeing those pegs come out, you've got some kind of soil structure. What is soil structure? It's uh, exposure to weathering and biological activity can bind soil particles together into what are called peds. And what binds them together is biological activity, um, there's all kinds of animals and, and insects that are working through their worms. They are living and breathing and excreting and dying and all that can bind the soil particles together. Also, as rainfall starts moving through the profile a lot, it will start finding a percolation route and you get freeze thaw, freeze thaw along those percolation routes a lot, and that starts to define PEDS. And obviously the older the soil is, the more it's been exposed to weathering, the more water is moved down through, the more freeze thaw and organic activity, the more obvious those PEDS will become. I like to use the cheese analogy. analogy. I was teaching it a soil course to archeologists at Pitt and one of my archeologist friends said, you know what? The development of soil um, structure is a lot like cheese. You have structuralist Velveeta. So here's Velveeta, it has no structure whatsoever. It's, uh, it's like pottery clay. It has no cracks in it. It's, uh, that's the way, <laughs> it's like plastic. Then you go on to cheddar, you're starting to get little cracks, you break it apart and it isn't smooth like you're breaking apart Velveeta. You're actually getting the beginnings of little, of little cracks. Now we come down to feta and look at the cracking. It's my favorite cheese anyway, so I love feta. And look at how it cracks. You can, you can break it into chunks 
even with light pressure, those, those are defined PEDs. <laughs> uh, single grained, it, it's, it's really no structure. There's no cohesion at all between particles. And this is very common for sand. It really doesn't have anything to bind it together. If you have a very high sand content, it's pretty hard to get PEDs because that it's the clay and the organics and all the live, nothing, not many things live in pure sand, it's hard. So um, if it has no structure because it's just sand particles, that's called single grained. And the other kind of having no structure is called massive. And that's like the Velveeta, this is pottery clay. There is cohesion here because these clay particles are sticking together, but that's the nature of the parent material. That hasn't, those, that cohesion has not developed from pedogenic processes. So this lack of soil structure is noted as massive structure. So single grained and massive, even though they're types of structure, they're types of no structure really. <laughs> So these are the types of soil structure. We have granular, that's typical for an A horizon. You get that nice granular structure. Blocky occurs in the subsoil. Prismatic also occurs in the subsoil with much older in uh, soils down in the lower portion of the horizon. Columnar really don't happen around here. This would be out in the more arid parts of the West where they have a problem with, uh, with the salt. Platy structure can occur if the soil is compacted. It doesn't happen all that often naturally, but we often find it at the base of a plow zone where the pressure of the plow going through has, has uh, compacted the soil. And here's single grained, which I already explained. The soil, uh, it's really hard uh, to sometimes coax it out and to figure out exactly what the soil structure. It's even hard for me and it's impossible in a uh, in an auger because you're getting either chewed up soil or a one inch uh, look at it. So I can generally see if there are cracks and stuff from a tube, tube auger, but a screw auger, it, the bucket auger, you're chewing it all up and all the peds have been destroyed. So it's tough to do. You really have to have a, a face of a soil like this. The first horizon to form is the surface a horizon. Now, this was all C horizon. This is a relatively new, unweathered sediment. This was off the Delaware River, if I remember right. Organics are begin to, beginning to accumulate in the A horizon, and crumb structure is starting to form. Now, you notice this is an A horizon. It's directly over a C. There is no B yet. You can have an A over C. If you put a B in here, it means something. There is no B here. So the A over C, I know right away, that's a relatively unweathered soil. That's really strong granular structure. This is a much older soil on a stable landform. If, if a floodplain is frequently flooded, scoured, you're not gonna see this kind of strong granular structure. It just doesn't have the time on a stable landscape. Uh, the granular structure and often the color of an A horizon, like we saw, can, it can be, remain intact after burial by additional sediment if that burial is rapid and thick enough to preserve the buried A out of the weathering zone. That's the upper part of the profile. So here, this is all de deforestation sediment. So that's a new C horizon. It's brand new. And I think a recent, recent flooding even there, we haven't even have an A horizon started here, but it happened so quickly that the A below that was buried has retained that granular structure and that, in, and that color. So if you're, if you're going down into a, into a profile and it is, if it gets darker, of course, there's the potential that it's a buried A. But sometimes the organics can get eaten up by, by roots, but that, re, that granular structure will remain. So keep your eyes peeled for any type of ped that's, that's fine, like, like the granular or the crumb structure. It might have been uh, an old A horizon. This one had a B underneath it. So this was a relatively stable landform where both an A and a B formed before deforestation 
covered it with them. Amazing. That was a big watershed. It's the Miami River in Ohio. And an awful lot of topsoil got stripped off that watershed and brought down onto this floodplain. Bee Horizon development is a result of exposure to the entire upper profile to weathering. In order for a bee horizon to form, the profile must be exposed to weathering in situ, left mostly undisturbed and intact. Bee horizons form only below weathering a horizon. If you find a bee horizon all by itself exposed at the surface, some that soil has been truncated and uh, the, the horizon is no longer there. You can have a little bit, a very small amount of deposition over the surface or a very small amount of, of scouring over the surface and still have beat up be, uh, cambic bee horizon development, but it, it can't be very much. So this is incipient soil weathering, a very weak BW. It's noted as a BW in the field and it's called a cambic horizon. Uh, this is, I think, a soil off the Delaware River. Um, it's noted in the field as a BW. It's ever so slightly lighter in color. It can sometimes be a, a slightly reddened soil because iron is moving out of the upper part of the profile down here and it's accumulating here because the water is moving down, down through the profile. It starts to slow and that iron can adhere to other soil particles. So the BW will start to sometimes look kind of red uh, ped um, structure. This is weak subangular blocky structure was starting to appear down here. So we think, okay, now we got a little bit of an older profile. You still have to go, you still have to test from the ground surface all the way down to you'll hit gravels. We have an older soil here, but it's still Holocene in age. As it continues to be exposed to weathering, products such as iron and clay will be produced in the surface. Clay gets loosened from silt particles predominantly, some sand particles, but um, feldspars mostly will yield clay out of the surface as they're exposed to weathering. That clay gets translocated down into the subsoil by water percolation. So here you're starting to see, this is a much, much old, old, older soil than we had seen in the previous slides. See all these cracks and we have uh, clay moving down. You'll see uh, clay films in, in some of my other um, pictures, but it looks like it's been ever so slightly painted with uh, like a wax or, or uh, it's a waxy kind of a, kind of a sleek, coatings it can sometimes be almost like, um, oh, what's that stuff they use to can? You put it on the top of jams and jellies. Oh, well, can't remember. But it's, uh, it's a waxy coating. Um, and those are clay films that have moved down into the profile. And that really starts to tell you that that is soil is forming in a very stable location with very little amounts, if any, of sediment deposition on the surface or scouring. This is a microscopic image of clay film. This is iron and clay along probably a root hair. It, it's a cavity left by a worm or a root or something. And that cavity, this is the matrix of the soil, sand and silt. And these clay particles are so small, we can't see them, but they're higher in iron and they're high in clay. They're, that's what they're, they're there was a, the, uh, a root hair or something that, that died and left this cavity and it's now being used as a percolation route for water. <clears throat> now, if you take a little section of that and put a scanning electron microscope of it, these are actual clay particles. They're the flat, they look like corn, cornflakes forming along the films and they're forming films along percolation routes. So I, I think that's fascinating that that's what clay particles look like, but you have to have a uh, scanning electron microscope to see them. This is an extremely old soil. These peds look like they were completely dipped in wax. And you can see the outline of every one of these, of these peds. That's a percolation route 
these are so well defined. You will never see anything like this in a Holocene alluvial soil. This is a this was at the top of a hill in a soil that had been generated out of um, out of shale and siltstone. But this is alluvial clay. This is clay that has moved down through the profile. There may have been primary clay from the from the, the matrix of the material that has been weathered, but look at all this alluvial clay that has been moved down into the subsoil. In field notes, this would be, you would call this horizon a BT. The T, and I forget what the T stands for. Um, it is alluvial clay, clay that has been translocated from the surface down into the subsoil. This is a Pleistocene terrace soil, so it's not as old as the previous slide, but you can see the, the clay films forming here and here, up here. It's a waxy coating, and this, this is much younger soil, but it's starting to form clay films. You really need a loop to see clay films. Now in the, in the slide before, they're, they're visible. You, you don't really need to have a loop to see those. But if you're looking to see an older Holocene soil, I was down in Alabama last week. I was using my loop constantly because a soil that's only 4,000 years old down there can have a lot of clay films, much, much more than we have up here because of their longer growing season and the hotter climate and the heavier rainfall. So to determine whether or not a BT, if you say BT in your notes, if you have the lab results, the, the particle size analysis, and you know that it's translocated clay into the subsoil compared to the surface, if you have a specific increase in clay, like you go from 50 or let's say 30% clay to 35% clay to the, in, the surf, in the subsoil, that percentage increase is defined in soil, soil taxonomy. So, and it changes for different textures of soil. And we're gonna get too deep in the weeds to really get into the definition. But if it meets their criteria, it can be called an argillic horizon. Not all BT horizons are argillic horizons. But to tell you the truth, I don't put BT down unless I'm pretty sure it meets the definition of the argillic horizon because that really means something up here. That's an old soil. We're, I mean, some people say that they've seen them in soils that are 5,000 year old, years old here in Pennsylvania. I guess it's possible. Uh, my soil morphology and genesis professor from Penn State it said it's impossible. He said it really has to be Pleistocene age or older. I'm not sure about that, but they really have to be pretty old in a very stable environment. Now, here's a quiz. This uh, little stream was dammed up. We used to see these all the time. This was a, a dam, but we used to see these with beaver ponds. We'd be walking along and you sink an auger down into the ground and you're, you're going through silts and all of a sudden you hit a clay layer. It's like, what the heck is that? Here, this small stream was dammed up and a pond formed. Um, clay sediments accumulated at the bottom as they do in quiet water. They have to be, the water has to be pretty quiet for clay to actually be deposited. Uh, then the dam was removed and the pond drained. After the stream reestablishes its channel and begins to, to deposit silty sediment again, you can see that this over here was some type of a floodplain. After this, after this area here begins to get a silty overbank sediment, will this clay layer at the bottom, okay, say you sink a, a auger boring in right here, you're going through silt and now all of a sudden you hit a clay layer. Is that considered an argillic horizon since it is higher in clay content than the overlying silty sediment? I hope you're all answering no. This is primary clay. This is not translocated clay. So I see this sometimes, um, and it can it can fool me sometimes. I'm sinking a 
uh, boring down through and I hit a clay layer, but it's the base of a swale. It's not an argillic horizon. So I've learned to, to not make judgments until I actually get out into the field. I saw this and I thought, man, there's nothing left of this soil. This is on the Allegheny River, I think at Freeport. Um, this Allegheny River is moving this direction. So we're on the Western Bank. And, um, but we got a backhoe and we had an undisturbed A, E and B horizons. And sometimes they're found where you're least expected. We had a nice A horizon here, a little bit of an E. An E horizon can form, it looks a little bit bleached. So see how it's lighter and it's not redder. The, the redder and the, and the brighter material down here is in the cambic horizon down below. So we had a surface A and it had been disturbed by fill. There was brick, here's a brick. Um, we had a lot of material up in here. There's a subtle E horizon and a reddened subsoil. I had no idea, but I'm glad I had the backhoe and actually took a look because there were massive sites up there. <laughs> this is right at the interface between a disturbed portion of the, of the A and an intact portion of the B. And I saw that, and I don't see them right in the wall very often. And I removed it. Somebody cleaned it off. So, yep. And I stuck it back in and took the picture. So, you never know. Here is Phil. I saw all this Phil. I sunk my one meter uh, auger boring down into here. And I thought, mm, that's, that's just all Phil. I don't know what's below it. So, I got my bucket auger and went through the fill and then whoops I, I don't know how to go back oh well went through that darker material and then hit the pleistocene outwash gravels at the bottom so yeah they had they had to broaden out uh i think of what is that a three by three and then sink um there were sites all up and down that was the miami river valley so generally speaking this is very very simplified but soil land form relationships on the upland, you're gonna get that really well developed that we saw that look like they'd been dipped in, in paraffin, that's what it is. Um, you get definitely an A with a very well developed B, sometimes the, the rock underneath, but that's the upland and often the colluvium. Down on the first floodplain and don't get fooled by recent alluvium. The soil survey will sometimes say recent alluvium, well, that's geologically recent. So it can be eight or 10,000 years old and still be called recent alluvium. But generally speaking, it's less than five. But um, the first bottom, this, this gets frequently scoured and redeposited, not always. But you may have only an A over a C. It's young, but it can still contain archaeological resources. The second bottom, some people call it a tear. I call the the bottom of the floodplain and then a higher floodplain, sometimes a terrace, sometimes the second floodplain. That's where you're going to get, this could be Pleistocene in age, it could be, um, you know, early Holocene. Um, you're going to get A and B horizon development, but not as well developed as these Bs up here. So you'll get moderately well developed. So, uh, the soils of Pennsylvania are varied and beautiful, and I've loved working here. I, I've worked all over the, the East, and I, I think I've enjoyed Pennsylvania the much. Alabama's pretty cool, too, but I, I love looking at, at soil, and I'm so glad you were here to listen to me. Thank you very much. <laughs>